Winnie Wong ähm, ist äh, hier bei uns die, ähm, die Gründerin der Kampagne People for Bernie Sanders war. Das ist eine Kampagne, die sozusagen nicht der Wahlkampf von Bernie Sanders war, sondern das, was drumherum ähm, passiert ist, wo Leute, ganz unterschiedliche gesellschaftliche Gruppen, Bewegungen und Organisationen sich äh, sozusagen beteiligt haben daran, die Kandidatur und die Kampagne von Bernie Sanders zu einer gesellschaftlichen Kraft ähm, und einem, einer gesellschaftlichen Bewegung zu machen. Sie ist außerdem äh, auf dem also sozusagen strategischen Leitungsgremium des Women's March in den USA und hat in einer ganzen Reihe von Wahlkämpfen, die jetzt in den Zwischenwahlen stattgefunden haben und zum Teil es ja auch bisher rüber geschafft haben, äh, beraten äh, und ver versucht sozusagen zu pushen für linke Kandidatinnen und Kandidaten innerhalb der demokratischen Partei. Also sowohl in den Vorwahlen als auch dann in den eigentlichen Midterms. So I said already everything about Winnie. <lacht> ähm, Claire Sandberg, äh, die beiden arbeiten viel zusammen, ähm, hat im Innern der Bernie Sanders Kampagne gearbeitet, war da ähm, zuständig für, was auf Englisch heißt Distributed Organizing. Das ist nicht so einfach zu übersetzen. Es ist sozusagen ähm, der Teil der Wahlkampagne, der auch dafür da ist, dass sozusagen verschiedene ähm, gesellschaftliche Gruppen und Aktive innerhalb ähm, der Partei oder innerhalb der Aktivistinnen und Aktivisten sozusagen selbstständig ähm, eine dynamische Rolle in dem Wahlkampf übernehmen und dadurch der, die, der Wahlkampf und die Kampagne insgesamt Füße bekommt, wie man so sagt, also ähm, äh, ausstrahlt. Ähm, auch ähm, Claire war in den Wahlkämpfen, die jetzt in den Midterms ähm, gelaufen sind, an verschiedenen äh, Kampagnen beteiligt, sowohl bei den Vorwahlen als auch ähm, bei den eigentlichen Wahlen. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass Sie hergekommen sind. Wir haben eine ganze Reihe von Diskussionen, die sich um die Frage, was, gibt, was ist die linke Antwort auf die, den, den Aufstieg der Rechten in ganz unterschiedlichen Ländern. Darüber haben wir eine ganze Reihe Diskussionen und Debatten in den vergangenen und kommenden Tagen. Und eine davon ist eben diese hier. Mein Name ist Christina Keindl. Ich leite den Bereich Strategie und Grundsatzfragen bei der Partei Die Linke und habe auch in diesem Zusammenhang mit Winnie und Claire schon verschiedentlich zusammengearbeitet. Ja, ich würde gleich einsteigen vielleicht mit, der, mit dem Szenario oder mit der Ausgangsfrage, die, diese, die ja auch in der Überschrift dieser Veranstaltung steht. Wenn wir uns umschauen in der Welt, dann gibt es offensichtlich einen Aufstieg von extremer rechter Politik und ähm, extrem rechten Figuren. Ähm, Donald Trump ist der mächtigste und bekannteste, gefolgt von Bolsonaro und allen möglichen anderen kleineren und mittleren, wie soll man sagen, Mussolinis, ähm, die überall ihren Kopf heben. Erstaunlich finde ich ist, wenn man ähm, sich umschaut, dass in ganz unterschiedlichen Gesellschaften diese erfolgreiche, extreme oder populistische Rechte, wie man es nennen mag, ganz ähnliche Kämpfe und Auseinandersetzungen nach vorne stellt. Man hat das Gefühl, es gibt ein gemeinsames Skript. Und obwohl die Gesellschaften so unterschiedlich sind, gelingt es offensichtlich den Rechten, darum herum Resonanz zu schaffen, Seiten anzusprechen, die aktivierend sind, die Leute auf die Straße bringen. Und darüber würde ich gerne den, die, darum würde ich gerne die erste Frage stellen. Das ist ja ein Bogen, der sich in gewisser Weise von dem Aufkommen der Tea Party bis, zu, bis heute sozusagen spannt in den USA und dann äh, aber auch in, in viele andere Länder ähm, repliziert wurde oder ähm, dort eigenständig entstanden ist. Und meine Frage wäre ein bisschen, was ist euer Blick darauf? Ähm, was ist das? Ist es tatsächlich so, dass es einen gemeinsamen Skript gibt und warum funktioniert es so gut? Was ist der Kern dieses rechten Projektes? Vielleicht könnt ihr ein bisschen euren Blick auf diese Entwicklung beschreiben, bevor wir dann auf die Antworten von links zu sprechen kommen. Ja. 
Thank you. Um, thank you all for um, coming out on this rainy evening. It is great to be here in Berlin. Um, and it is always great to work with RLS um, as well as the left party, Die Linke. Um, I don't want to talk too much about why this is happening. So I want to kind of give you a very short answer. Resources are shrinking all over the world. Resources that have been extracted by a hundred years of growth, of endless growth, capitalist growth, driven by the capitalist class, those resources are disappearing. And so the common thread between these different authoritarian strongmen who have been placed in office is that they are being controlled by an international cartel of bankers and transnational corporations. So this is a small cartel, not a small cartel actually, a, signif a significant cartel of, um, of the 1%. I mean, there are many, many types of people who, who wear the uniform 1%. If you own, if you have 27, I think the, the, the number is if you, if you have $27 million in net assets, including your home and what you have in your bank, then you're considered a 1%, 1%er. percent we are talking about the 0.001%. Um, they're panicked. They have shareholders. They have to, um, they have to meet the demands of their show shareholders. And so this is what's happening. It's actually, as when Bernie Sanders says, the billionaire class, that's exactly what he means. There's just very little oil left without, you know, if you dig into, if you, if you start drilling into, into Alaska, or if you start doing like unending drilling into parts of Arabia, um, or other parts where there is oil, then that means um, further um, ecocide on the planet, causing irreversible climate change. We already know that climate change is irreversible. So that's, that's the short answer for, you know, for um, a pretty complicated question. There just isn't, there isn't enough. There isn't enough oil to go around. There isn't enough um, minerals to um, make your cell phones. You know, like the coltan is owned by, you know, China. The rare earths are owned by China, 97% of them. You know, so it's tricky. You know? Um, yeah, well, one, I will just say that I think as, as much as there are many factors in common, we have to be aware that there are important different uh, differences in different national contexts. Um, the rise of the far right in the US uh, emerges directly out of the election of the first black president in the US and the, and the reaction to that. Um, it's a very clear trajectory. And Donald Trump was, of course, a part of that in being the person who started the movement to question his very Americanness and demanding his birth certificate. Um, but I do think there are some significant commonalities. Uh, as Winnie said, we are living in a global economy where even in countries that are relatively prosperous, there's growing uncertainty, uh, precarity. And the far right has, um, has exploited fears uh, about the future and has encouraged people to think in terms of, um, to, to think that things are zero sum, that it's a zero sum gain. And if someone else gain, if someone else is going to do better, that um, there has to be someone who loses and does worse and has encouraged people to think in terms of, in, in ethno-nationalist terms, about whether their group is doing better or worse relative to other groups. Um, and that's extremely powerful. And I think that to some degree, those um, group identities are always present in a latent way. And, and it's a, it only was maybe a matter of time and also, of course, a result of the, um, the lack of vision from the center uh, for the breakdown in a consensus about liberal values to happen and for people to start exploiting those. Um, I think the other thing that's really notable is that the far right has uh, learned from the left 
And we saw that with the Trump campaign and the grassroots movement around it, that they, they actually copied the Bernie Sanders movement, in particular the grassroots online Bernie Sanders movement. Um, and we just saw in Spain um, that Vox had their rally in September in the Vista Alegre arena to show that they were in some ways following in the footsteps of Podemos. So um, it's, a, it's a major challenge. <laughs> Let's talk more about that. Sehe ich das richtig, dass niemand von euch die Übersetzung nutzt? Is anybody using the translation of you guys? Um, is there any reason we need to speak half in German for the... Okay, so... It, it doesn't look like nobody said yes on this, <laughs> on this angle. Okay, so then we'll try and change to English in, in case in the discussion any one of you feels more comfortable in asking their questions in German, please feel totally free to do so, and we will have the translation um, ready for that. Um, well, maybe just to ask one question on the right uh, before we shift over to the left, because I feel part of their success is always to move the, uh, the battle towards um, cultural and gender questions, and always keep shift, they always keep shifting the battlefield, kind of the playground, um, where they kind of want to stage their battles against us. And I thought that, uh, for example, in Brazil, that was interesting that that didn't really seem to be an issue in this society, and, but it still worked, um, kind of riling people up against gender equality and things like that. Um, and, and I think it poses an, a question towards our, our uh, politics, how we succeed to combining these gender and LGBTIQ um, politics with class politics and a populism that actually uh, comes together with people from who are not well off. So they don't feel that those are like luxury questions of the liberals, but that kind of that, that we are able to, to combine these issues to a kind of vision that is uh, compelling for, for all of them. I don't know if, what your take is on that. Yeah, I mean, this is a good question. Um, it's also very complicated, and this is something that Claire and I always talk about um, in private when we're talking through like what kind of strategies we might you know, deploy in our trainings or what we might be doing in terms of like the work that we do in the social movements. Um, this is actually a failure of like liberalism um, liberal identity politics, as, as we know it. Um, you may know it differently than uh, people in America may know it, but certainly in the United States, um, liberalism or big tent liberalism uh, for 20 years has really focused on sort of three main groups, um, LGBTQIA, um, women, um, and then uh, the people who are advocating for gun control. It's always been, you know, I like to be a little crude when I say guns, gays, and vaginas. That's how it's always been for 20 years. There was never really a class analysis until the Sanders campaign forced it to happen. Um, and of course, in the two decades of big tent liberalism, you um, saw, you know, the, the, the Clintons really implement policies of neoliberalism. Um, uh, of course, you know, NAFTA. Um, when I was when I was a young person, you know, you could only get apples that were grown in the region that I grew up in, in the Northeast. And then by the time I was in high school, I could get apples from Japan, which I, which I thought was <laughs> strange. But I've grown accustomed to getting anything I want, whenever I want, from wherever I want it to come from, because I live in New York now, um, and I'm in my 40s. So we've we've come a long way in the last 30 years. Um, and in that time period, um, women um, have been, I guess, acculturated is, is one way of putting it, into conforming to the standards of patriarchal capitalism, which is, you know, for another discussion, because this isn't a radical socialist feminist group discussion or reading group, but that's what has happened. Right, where in, 20, in the last 20 years or so, the women's rights movement has been sort of rooted in like um, reproductive justice without having like a fully fleshed analysis of like political economy. 
So I, I talk about this with Carol all the time. It's, 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 it's an anomaly that you'll meet a woman who wants to really talk about capitalism. And when I mean capitalism, I don't mean like three volumes of capital. I mean like what do the international monetary markets like look like day to day? And how do they really like control your womb? Like th that's a question that needs to, to be answered, um, which is why the Women's March is such a significant movement, a significant decentralized movement. It's a big, big tent. And some of us who are hiding under that tent, like myself and other leaders in the movement, are struggling to um, figure out what the messaging should be and how we can create political education at scale so that women are, are able to articulate why they should have um, agency over their bodies and why the patriarchy has controlled us for so long. It's very difficult to do that. Um, because when you start talking about it, people are like, what is this, like sociology 101? They don't really want to hear it. So it's important to figure out how to articulate it in a simple way. And you know, with the senator in the United States and other people who are like leading activists in the United States, the best way to do it is, of course, through um, people who are um, working um, um, women, who are working um, as domestic workers. Um, or who are working as um, home health care workers, or who are working as retail service sector workers. That's the best way to do it, is by educating those, um, that class of women. Um, and then, of course, more recently you had M Michelle Obama take the stage, um, saying, lean in, that shit doesn't work all the time. She's known that shit for a long time, because Michelle Obama certainly has an understanding of political economy. The Obamas do, right? And only now, in 20, 2018, when the shit is really hitting the fan, is she saying this, but only in the wake of selling two million copies and becoming a $60 you know, million dollar brand. So, you know, we have a lot of struggles ahead, ahead of us. Um, so I think that um, something that's a co been a commonality in a number of different contexts that has been, that has worked well, uh, is one just repolarizing, so um, framing the conflict not around um, in-group, out-group, and uh, ethno-nationalist terms, um, and but reframing it around the top versus the bottom. Uh, I think that you know Corbyn has been doing that, Bernie has been doing that, uh, and Bernie, even with uh, even in the Trump presidency, where there are there's a relatively durable base of support for Donald Trump, he's now the most popular politician in the US uh, because uh, he's able to win over, over an overwhelming number of Democrats and significantly many people who voted for Donald Trump, who, uh, which is not the majority of them, but it's enough of them. Um, so I think there, there's going to be a, a sizable base of the population that is unfortunately open to authoritarian ideas mm -hmm and that is um, just in favor of social hierarchies and, and um, uh, dominance of the powerful over the less powerful. Um, but I think that um, a, a, a left populist framework can shift some of them. And I think that the left also has to do a better job of telling our own narratives about uh, loss aversion. Um, I think something that the right did very, has been doing very well is uh, using just the, the specter, the idea that you are going to lose something powerful and symbolic about your identity or your material circumstances, and that threat is the reason that you need to um, stand with the right, even if it's not real, it's only perceived, even if it's not to you personally, if it's just a loss in standing of your group. Um, and so something that we were actually having a conversation about earlier today was claiming back the word take, that... Um, the, the billionaires and Wall Street, the big banks are taking, are stealing from working people and invoking that same sense that we need to, um, we need to take action to prevent that loss um, and then reimagining that battle along class lines um, can be powerful. And I think that picking direct fights with major corporations. I and mean, we saw that even with, uh, with Democrats 
not having the ability to uh, govern very effectively considering our system that we're able to deliver tremendous wins with, uh, with Bernie Sanders just using his platform as a messenger to win a $15 an hour minimum wage for Amazon workers from Jeff Bezos. Um, so I think that those are the kinds of actions that, and those are the kinds of campaigns that can um, bring people in to our political coalition and also um, inspire people and, and, and polarize things in such a way that, that the split works for us. I just want to say one more thing. So I actually talked to um, a number of um, senior Podemos advisors yesterday and also today, and they shared with me um, their take on what happened um, last week, or yes, last week. And they said, we were, we were very surprised. We didn't, we didn't expect this. Um, we thought we didn't expect that that Vox would win. And then they told me that it was over a period of seven days where they held a series of rallies, the same rallies that Donald Trump likes to hold. Um, and also Bernie Sanders and any, any politician. I mean, it, it is pretty common to hold political rallies. And then they revealed to me that um, the messaging, the political messaging that Vox used was decidedly anti-feminist. And they were baffled. They said, "What? They said, how does that work? Why do you think that is? You know?" And they're like, "We're very concerned about about this. Um, we don't know what to do. We took your advice, and we elevated women in our in our party. They did actually take my advice, and they made a, a sort of, you know, feminist Podemos movement. Um, and the right actually decided to um, attack um, by." creating a seven-day campaign, which won them 12 regional seats in, in Parliament, regional Parliament in Andalusia. And the framework of, of that campaign, the, the political messaging of that campaign is, the women of Spain are rising and our manhood is threatened. So this goes back, again, to women's movements and why they're so significant. Because the Socialist feminists of Podemos, and Podemos very rarely uses the framing socialists. They're very different than, than, than the Elenka who are open about saying, well, we're, we're socialist. Podemos only started kind of taking, taking kind of um, reclaiming the word socialism after Bernie um, came, to, came to become a, a meme and after the normalization of democratic socialism. When they first started campaigning in 2014, 2015, the political project that they imagined um, had was one that would actually eliminate the word socialism from its rhetoric. And now they're like, yes, we're gonna start using the word, you know, socialist feminism, the term socialist feminism again, and it backfired. And the reason why it backfired is because there isn't, again, a worldwide movement led by socialist feminists. It's very problematic. If you were paying attention to and this is what the right has been doing. They've been actually, the, the whole incel movement, how many of you are familiar with the incel movement? Do you know what an incel is? Raise your hand if you know what an incel is. The, you four in the front there, the beanie and the, and the redhead, you, you, do you know what an incel is? I want you to go home and Google it, and then I want you to go down a YouTube rabbit hole, and I want you to watch every video you can find of incels, and then I want you to get together in your, in your meeting groups. And your, and your local bar and talk about like why this is, how you feel about it. And I, then I don't want you to convert and support the right, I want you to come back and help Dilinka. <laughs> incels, let me tell you about incels. Steve Bannon and the far right have been um, seeding a movement known as incels. Incels are led by young white men who um, don't ever have sex. Um, and incels is short for involuntary celibacy. They're involuntarily celibate. And they are resentful that women, like myself, or like Claire, or like the you know, fine young ladies who have made it to this panel, are, 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 are saying, no, we get to control our bodies. And this movement is very dangerous. Most people doing politics don't understand it. Even my colleagues in, in America don't really understand the sort of subterranean um, the, the, the subterranean growth 
of this really underground movement. But it is the incels of Andalusia who powered the rise of Vox in a seven day period. And so when you start thinking about that, the short, how, how, quick it, how quickly it happened, you should be afraid. So our challenges are, are, are many. And one of the solutions is to make sure that we have revolutionary armies led by women. You know, where men hang out too. You know, you, you know, we had that in Spain in the 30s. I'm not suggesting that we do it the same way, but revolutionary, revolutionary women, you know, meaning women to the front, right? Women to elected office, women at the front of political life, women at the front of activist life, women at the front of like academic and intellectual life. We, need, we really need that more than ever now. Um, so when you think about Donald Trump, 51% of white women in America voted for Donald Trump. We don't know why, we still don't know why. We don't know why, but we're gonna talk more about women in, in a moment, Christina. No, no, I was just saying um, that, I mean, they voted for Trump despite him saying, just grab them by the pussy, which was, <coughs> I'm sorry. Well, they don't care, I mean, they just, they actually don't, they don't like, m like most people, don't care, like most women in America, and, 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 and many places, you, you are not, we are not, I'm like not the, the majority. I'm absolutely an anomaly. Like most women you will meet anywhere in the world, in the, in the developed Western world, don't care if like a man cat calls them, you know? They just don't give a shit. Like they, they, they want to be skinny and they want to be beautiful and they want to be attractive and alluring to them. This is capitalism. <laughs> That's the culture that, like, has, that we've lived under for so long. That's just the truth. I mean, I think that like, radical women care. You know, women who have the privilege of going you know, to university and then you know, being mentored by another woman or having an experience in a sociology class or reading an incredible piece of like, philosophy that stirred or impacted them in some way. But the majority of like, women like, living in like, the Western world between the ages of like, 18 and like, 50, you know? Fertile women, they don't care. They don't care about being catcalled or grabbed at. And that's why the capitalist class are so successful. They've weaponized us as a gender. It's terrible. Not the right or the left, the capitalist class. So that's very important. They've weaponized us and we've gone along with it. You know? And some of the greatest handmaidens of this movement are people like Hillary Clinton. This is not, you know, I mean, those of you in this room, you understand that. I mean, she's like a great handmaid. And, 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 and Michelle Obama, and, until very recently, where she's like, should I break, break free? Should I say something? Not before I make a lot of money. So. Well, I just want to say, I don't think it's, I think that we do know why at least a lot of white women voted for Trump, which is a majority of white women, white people in the US. Um, are uh, motivated by Christian beliefs. They're opposed to abortion. They are afraid that the country is going to become majority non-white, non-Christian. And so many of them saw a lot of the problems with Donald Trump, saw him as a flawed person, but saw him as a means to an end for restricting abortion and also uh, creating a system of minority rule in the coming decades as they become the minority. Um, so I think that there's a situation here where you do have these radical online subcultures where you have, you know, the incels and then the, the hardcore racists who have always been there and then the incels over time becoming involved in these kinds of very toxic race science ideas and getting radicalized over, over time in a process of radicalization that begins with them going online for support because of their involuntary celibacy, <laughs> driving an extremist movement that's able to hijack the right and then a lot of people who are going along with it because they have some general anxieties about demographic shifts or are socially conservative and will always vote conservative, no matter what, um, or fears about law and order. The, the, the left 
has to win the culture war, though. We, ha we have to win the culture war because the right is actually currently winning the culture war. That's true. Even if we feel cool and hip because, like, we hang out at, like, DSA meetings or, like, you guys, this is a cool and hip crowd, you know? But you're not the majority because the right is totally winning, you know? Like, Jordan Peterson... I, like I go all over the I go all over the world and speak, and usually I speak to rooms of well not twenty people, but usually like three hundred to five hundred, you know. And they're all like cool and hip people, and they like love to hang out afterwards. And they're like, oh, you're smart, or let's you're cool, like let's do this. Jordan Peterson speaks all over the world, and he sells out rooms of five to ten thousand people. People are paying like a hundred dollars a ticket to like listen to that guy talk, and he's the king of the incels. They're winning the culture war. We're not winning the culture war, and that's a problem. That's why political projects, like Jacobin, are important. That's why all the you know, different literary magazines that RLS puts out, they're important. You have to do all of it, and you have to win elections. But we're not, not only are we not winning elections, we're also not winning the culture war. There are some interventions inside the culture war now that um, have been effective, but um, overall, we're like losing until until we are you know until until like Claire or myself are able to sell out rooms, you know, um, of ten thousand, you know, rooms where ten thousand people pay to see us speak. I've spoken to like large crowds before, but it's usually in a university setting, you know, like five thousand people in a university setting. No independent promoter would say, yeah, we want to bring her to you know, a venue that we've paid for, we've booked out of our own money and we're gonna charge $100. We're, we're losing the culture war. And because we're, um, we t the left tends to be very self-aggrandizing, um, we, we, don't, we don't believe that at all. Because we look at people like Jordan Peterson and we look at, you know, other people who are winning the culture war on the right and we say, no. We're so much cooler than they are. And, and that's, that might be true, but that's actually not true because large numbers of people, even in Germany, in Bavaria and other places where the IFD are rising, are, um, you know, like checking out what's going on on YouTube, watching the videos in German. Some, some of the videos are in English and they're like, these incels are pretty cool. That sounds good, because the incels are not just talking about like how they're not having sex. They're talking about like why nobody's having sex. And like in, in talking about why nobody's having sex, they are able to articulate like some kind of blame on like brown people, you know, who are coming from Libya, taking their jobs, preventing them from having it's it, it it's like I recommend you take a deep dive on YouTube to the world of incels because that's what's actually like um, um, powering the right right now is a combination of incels being funded by a cartel of like white billionaires who believe in this like junk race science. You know, at the, at the very top are a few white men in America and also in England and other places in Europe here in Germany and France as well who believe in race science. Um, yeah, I mean, like, look, we could talk about Judeo-Christianity and the rise of capitalism another time. It's for a different room, and it, it's worth exploring. But any time I hear anybody on the left talking about how we lost an election because of, like, God or the God voters, like, why are people God voters in 2018? Why are they God voters? Because institu the institutions of capitalism are, are, are being upheld so that people can stay God voters. It's just how it works. So we take a look on the campaigns that you've been conducting over the last months. Would you say there's, um, there's some standing out in kind of furthering this question, like how to combine the cultural war, the more represent more um, constituencies that normally don't get represented, and kind of are, are a stake in this counter-hegemonic counter movement? Do you? Do you want to try talking about white women? No, you, I want you to talk about that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, but, the, but so the question is around 
interventions and also candidates from this past year um, where we have tried to, um, to fight back against this. Um, I think, well, just to speak to, to Kavanaugh, which I, I probably won't do justice because when he was more deeply involved, um, but you know, we have this Supreme Court nominee in the US um, who uh, not only, it turned out, was a, a serial sexual predator um, who, what, and misogynist, um, but who also was just one of the most um, anti-democratic, crazy, crazy yeah. anti-worker, <laughs> captured, uh, partisan um, nominees, maybe nominee who's ever been put forward for any major federal judgeship, who literally wrote the opinion about why, do you know what SeaWorld is? Have you ever heard of that? SeaWorld where they, they have like, giant whales in tiny pools. Um, there was a, a, a worker who was killed by an orca whale at SeaWorld and Kavanaugh literally wrote the opinion defending SeaWorld from having to face regulations to protect workers after that worker was torn limb from limb by a whale. So this is the kind of person he, he was and is. Um, and it's a... Uh, it was extraordinary because a lot of the, I, I think, to talk broad, just to take a step back for a second, we have had to make a series of tactical alliances and we will continue to with the center to fight the right. And I think we're gonna continue to do that. But we'll see, we see that they oftentimes fail to even fight. So there were a number of um, groups like, for instance, and dem leading democratic politicians like Chuck Schumer who's the Senate Minority Leader for the Democrats said that he didn't even want to try to stop this, this appointment of Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court because he wanted to, he didn't want that to be the message for the election without understanding that the Supreme Court is actually more important than the midterm elections because it's a lifetime appointment. Um, and it was women disrupting over and over again and talking about reproductive access and ab abortion rights not having, not losing control of their bodies, also voting rights, protecting our democracy, um, who were able to actually make the vote very close, although we still did lose. And, uh, and no one thought that it was even gonna be close or that it was gonna be any kind of a contentious battle at all. Um, and I don't think, and this goes to Winnie's point about the importance of uh, claiming the mantle of of women and fighting with women at the front, I don't think that we could have, in in our political context, gotten that level of dissent if we tried to organize it around uh, workers' rights or voting rights. It would not have had the same level of power. Um, but, uh, but there was, of course, a major backlash to it where there were a lot of people who, um, who emerged and said, you know, this woman is lying, these women are all lying, and, uh, and, and rallied around Kavanaugh to, uh, to protect him. So um, I, I think Winnie should say a little bit more about it, but, um, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about the candidates. Yeah. And I, just to, to add, like, I think the real backlash is even more that people came out and saying, even so, like even if it's true. Exactly. That was astonishing, I thought, a kind of a break of the, culture that, I mean, if you go yeah. back to how scandalized sexual relations usually were in high, uh, high offices uh, in the U.S., that was a kind of a new, I thought. Well, because the president already sort of normalized it. Like, I mean, he had been accused by 13 women of, like, groping their vaginas or whatever, like, you know, and people were like, yeah, that, that's fine, no problems, like, he paid off. Like, look, he can sleep with as many porn stars as he wants. I think that porn stars are awesome and I think that they should be like taxed and they should get like HIV checks and I think the same for sex workers, you know? P women should have agency to do whatever they want with their bodies, right? Like, and that's how I feel. The problem with, with him is that there was no consent. The, the word that we have to examine here is consent. You know, if you're a woman and you consent to making, um, having sex on camera, that's, consensual, like you're saying, I consent to this. He groped women multiple times, and um, those allegations were unheard. And he's the president, so they were like, yes, this is not a problem. Um, Kavanaugh maybe groped her when she was 15 at a party, we don't know. Um, but 
to Claire's point, we were able to create like a really um, dramatic shift in the narrative because we uh, allied ourselves with you know uh, people who were not as like far left as we are and said, okay, like let's just center this um, protest on reproductive justice and reproductive rights and see what happens. Um, and it did backfire to some extent, but then it didn't because it actually struck fear in the hearts of the, of the white men in the Senate because they were like, what is this shit? Why are there like 10,000 white women, educated white women, getting arrested? What the fuck? Like, they're charging the Supreme Court steps. They're taking time off of work. And some of them are holding signs up that aren't just talking about reproductive rights. It seems as if there's some analysis around economic justice we feel a little bit destabilized by this. Something is happening here. They could see the first signs of like revolt. And they knew that that revolt was being pioneered or, or orchestrated by me, actually, and by another woman, Linda Sarsour, who is one of the co-chairs of the Women's March and a good friend of mine, and uh, Tamika Mallory, a black woman, uh, who was also one of the co-chairs of the Women's March. And they said, they thought to themselves, you know what? We're not gonna lose to the women of color. We can't concede, they could have given him up and appointed somebody else. There was a long list of other people that they could have chosen because we disrupted constantly for a month. We were on the cover of every newspaper and on every like news channel. And we normalized something about civil disobedience and protest and demonstration. And there were different leaders in, in that movement who, including myself, who wrote uh, op-eds, opinion pieces, and placed them in, in, in uh, publications widely read. Um, where we actually talked about in great detail why Kavanaugh um, was and is a bad um, choice to, to hold a seat for 40 years. Some of my op-eds, obviously, really um, in great detail, talked about his track record um, as a federal district court judge and how he always sided with corporations, which is, again, rare for women, because there were other people in the in the coalition who would only just talk about reproductive justice. They started to feel afraid that, that like the organizing could be led by a diverse coalition of women who would not just be talking about reproductive justice. It made them a little bit uneasy. We're just getting started, by the way. These, these demonstrations are going to scale in 2019 and 2020. And um, we hope um, to, next January, mobilize you know, many thousands of women to come to Washington to train um, and when I say train, we're going to train them to do civil disobedience just in case. Civil disobedience meaning, well, taking an arrest. You know, the only way you win, the only way you change culture is, of course, by, um, well, entering the institutions or building your own institution and by um, social movements, mass demonstration. There, those, are, those are the only two ways you actually can change culture. Um, and historically, that's been true with the civil rights movement and any other type of rebellion you've seen in history. You have to have mass numbers of people participate around an idea. Um, and so if those ideas are being written by women and our male allies, I don't think that that sits well with the bankers. I really don't. That's why they hate Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> um. And something that's interesting actually is, you know, a lot of the people who, who, even though we lost that Supreme Court seat, so many people who participated were so angry that it really did fuel the uh, blue wave that we saw in the number of Democratic seats that we were able to win in the election. Um, so something that I think we've seen several times on the left, and there's been a lot of excitement about a handful of different progressive leaders who are sort of these standout stars, um, which is really important because they're helping to define what the party stands for and show where the energy is in the party. So Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, she's from a deep blue district that is always going to elect a Democrat. But she, the, her, her power is not in how big her office is. She's one congresswoman out of several hundred. Um, she's you know a first time congresswoman. But she has a very loud voice to define what the party is and what the party should be. Um, so, so in combination of electing a few of those leaders through, uh, through interventions like the anti-Kavanaugh protests and the Women's March and then other social movements, we're able to um, kind of 
define what the party should be, where the activist base is, and pull the entire party. So it's, it's sometimes people, and we're, we're talking right now a lot about the US, and I know we want to talk more, more broadly as well, but um, just focus on how the, the left is doing in the US in terms of the success or failure of individual politicians and how much they control. But uh, I think a better metric is how the degree to which left politicians like Bernie and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez now are able to get the other democratic politicians to accept all of their demands by setting the agenda and how much outside social movements are able to um, bring women in, for instance, under the banner of defending abortion access and rights and then teach them about, uh, teach them about capitalism. <laughs> and talk to them about intersectionality and racial justice and voting rights and define the agenda of what it means to be a feminist as including those things, including a Green New Deal, including Medicare for All, um, including immigration reform and voting rights. Yeah. And that's, so it's been a kind of, um, that's been the process that we've had to use is, because at this point the number of, of left uh, stars like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez we have elected in Congress is, is only a tiny fraction. The majority of new Democrats who we elected in November were centrists. And, but, but we are over time redefining what it means even to be a centrist and we're moving it to the left. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you look at like AOC, she's not even a congresswoman yet. She doesn't, she's not going to be, um, uh, she, she, it's not until January 3rd, you know, so she's like still going through orientation. And she's been in DC, you know, the last, you know, several weeks getting oriented, you know, meeting people and kind of getting her office space and getting, you know, acclimated. But of course, because she's a social media star and also has so much earned media, she's used her platform um, to amplify ideas. And she will be remembered when we eventually get a Green New Deal. She will be remembered as a woman, right? A young woman, a young millennial woman of color presenting this policy idea. And that's great. That's amazing. That is, she's already done her job. She doesn't have to do anything ever again. Because when you think about Congress, they don't do anything. They really don't. They haven't in a long time. Bernie hated being a congressperson. He likes being a senator better because you just have more power in the Senate. In the Congress, where there are 435 elected members, they, like, for the most part, like, don't do anything, like, ever. It's just, like, very strange. I, you know, they each get, like, a $1.5 million budget to, like, hire staff, and then they don't do anything for, like, the 12 or 15 or sometimes 20 years they stay elected. So we need term limits and we need some people who have like brains to actually do something. And the women who have preceded AOC have, you know, they, the, the legislation that they've proposed has not been like this. It's not been so radical and transformative and um, um, also a, a piece of legislation that actually addresses the um, failures of capitalism. So I think that's incredible that, that she did that. Um, and I hope that like, you know, someone on the left here in, in Germany will present um, a Green New Deal for Europe because you, you, you need that. We need it all over the world. May I, bef just before we yeah. open it up maybe, um, do you have a favorite, uh, favorite experience in the, over the last campaigns where you said, okay, there, that was a point where it all came together like, the most uh, close to what you you think would be good, like um, having a electoral campaign, social movements, bringing together class and gender, or like so, not to make you go through all your campaigns. Just if you pick one where you'd say, okay, there's that's where you can learn the most of. What would you pick? I feel a little bit dead inside, so I don't really have like favorite moments. I, I know that sounds like terrible. Like, I feel a little bit dead inside. You know, like I've just done. I've been doing this shit for so long that like, I don't like get that excited. Sometimes I, I, I like I liked when like there when like a thousand women went inside the the Hart Senate building and like got arrested and were forced. Like the television stations were just like, oh, this is interesting. You know, I liked that. I thought as a tactic that was like one of my great, better, you know, better achievements in life. But like, 
in general, like I just, I just keep, I keep it moving, you know. Um, I really, I did really love um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez getting arrested. I thought that was great. Um, I loved that. So, I mean, that wasn't me, but I think that in some part, um, our actions preceding her taking that arrest helped her come to the conclusion that she needed to do it. That's great. I'd like to see um, more women politicians, you know, taking risks. It's your right to get arrested inside. And in fact, when she becomes a congresswoman, she can't get arrested. She could actually do a civil disobedience on the floor of Congress during a bill, and they couldn't arrest her. And that, you know, maybe, and she may do that, I bet she will, because I've, I've whispered to, to her that that might be a, a good thing to do. Um, in general, I, I feel good that people are, are still active um, in, in, in the Bernie grassroots. Um, and I also feel really happy that um, the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, continues to grow um, in numbers, um, seeing their membership numbers um, grow steadily and seeing the state unable to stop that growth, I really like, <laughs> so. Um, so one moment for me, um, just in political campaigns or? Well, as you wish. Okay, okay, well I'll say, so I was in the UK um, last year during the general election and remember at the very beginning seeing so many people who were diehard supporters of Jeremy Corbyn and Labour so despondent and convinced that this was their one opportunity and that the left was going to be banished for the next 20 years because they were going to lose by so much. They were down 40 points in the polls and the centrists were gonna retake the party and they were not gonna have any power for decades. Um, and seeing the manifesto come out and people start to have these that have this spontaneous reaction to it, and um, seeing the policies generate controversy in the media, generate outrage, but also get a lot of start to get a lot of people saying, actually, these make a lot of sense. You know, it would be really nice to have Wi-Fi on buses and trains, and to renationalize the rail system while we're at it. That would be great. Let's do it. Um, and and then, but but to see people doubt that other people were feeling the same way, and then the, the surprise and elation that night when actually there was a hung parliament um, was just so magical. And you know, I think it's, it's important to keep in mind that every single political system and the rules of the game are different. Um, where there, they were able to take over, the left was able to take over one of the two major parties, um, you know, which is different from the way that it is here. And of course, from, from the US, um, the major differences are that they don't really have money in politics in the same way and they have laws mandating that the media actually covers them. Um, and that was our biggest challenge for Bernie. So I wish that we could easily replicate that formula everywhere else and all, all we would have to do is like put out a manifesto and then <laughs> everything would be great. I don't think it'll be that simple, but it was a miraculous thing to see. All right, shall we open it up? Do you feel you can speak? Oh, you, there's the mics. Hello. <clears throat> um, I was confused when you guys were talking about the case of the Supreme Court, Kavanaugh, why the term reproductive justice, reproductive rights, uh, why those terms came up? Because to me, like infringing on someone's sexual freedom has nothing to do with reproduction, or am I, is it the term more vague? That confused me. So the movement, like the, the sort of feminist movement in the United States, at least at the institutionalized level, um, is led by, um, by um, activists who kind of got their start in the reproductive rights and reproductive justice move, movement, which means access to birth control. Um, and that, you know, that I, I guess that must have started. And, abor well, I, and abortion rights. If you, if you, I guess, you mean in contrast to saying just abortion rights and being straightforward about it because... Oh, okay. So, um, so one of the, the maybe the biggest battle, uh, the biggest issue that people in the U.S. fight over when it comes to our Supreme Court is whether or not abortion should be legal, and 
rolling back the Supreme Court decision that allowed for women to have legal access to abortion under a right to privacy. Um, so there are a lot of people who want to make abortion illegal again, who also want to restrict access to birth control and define abortion as being the moment that an egg is fertilized, um, which would even outlaw some forms of birth control. So that's why reproductive rights is a framework that we often use to organize people around uh, with the Supreme Court because um, a lot of people, a majority of people want to keep abortion, a vast majority of people actually in the US want to keep abortion legal and want, overwhelming numbers want to keep birth control legal and available, accessible. Um, but then there are many people who want to restrict that and remove it. And of course, it turns out that the same people who want to prevent women from having control over their bodies also do not care if women's bodily autonomy is uh, violated by sexual predators. So that's, does that answer the question? I think there are two things, and the, the the one thing is that it's like the reproduct, reproductive uh, sorry <laughs> reproductive rights implies the right not to reproduce. That is basically one of of the battles, and the other is that the sexual harassment was not all of it. It was just like one one entering point to this big battle that was going on, and that would not have been um, as easy to organize around. As like not say I'm not saying it didn't like I mean it did happen so it was, but it was one point that you could take up, but the the battle was as well, at least to the same degree ar around this right not to reproduce or, or the right to abortion. So uh, so Ro Roe v Wade was a landmark ruling, by the Supreme Court, um, granting that the court would never intervene on abortion. Um, yeah, Roe v. Roe v. Wade, yeah. So it's, it was a landmark um, ruling from the Supreme Court that this particular nominee had threatened to overturn. Um, and so that, not had threatened, but it was implied that in his past sort of uh, dissents that he could actually say this is not settled law. Again, this is like really sort of anodyne, nuance explanation of, of, of the law. But um, because of the historic ruling of Roe v. Wade, um, the institutions led by women in America typically um, center like defending reproductive rights and uh, reproductive or, repro uh, or um, abortion access all into sort of one program. Does that, does that make sense? In, instead, and, and that's actually been to the detriment um, of our democracy. I think, because if, if more institutions were led by women who had more of an analysis around political economy, like I said earlier, we would have a different outcome and we would have more AOCs in Congress saying we need a Green New Deal. A lot of the women legislators um, in the Democratic Party have spent the better part of their like career sort of um, um, fighting, advocating for you know reproductive justice and you know um, income equality. What, Pay equality, yeah, pay equality and reproductive justice are the two things that like women legislators have typically like advocated for inside the Congress. Um, and so I think the day will come soon when we have uh, women in Congress who will start saying, capitalism is terrible. Um, that could happen, you, you know, you guys are not used to that because like your left party here always talks about capitalism, they're not afraid to talk about it. But it's like if you wanna become sort of a majority party or if you want to you know go from 10 to 15 to 20 percent you do have to sort of reframe um, that debate a little bit and that's kind of why Claire and I are here right now we're working with the left party and working with RLS um, on figuring out like what those strategies like look like because all over the world um, this is this is sort of an ongoing would you say it's a crisis is it a crisis yeah it's a it's 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 a crisis you know even even the, like the whole idea of like reproductive justice, or, or you know, a woman saying, no, I don't want to have a baby, that's like the incel argument. When a man says, you must have a baby, you have to have a baby. 
And if women are saying, no, I don't want to have a baby, then that's bad. And that's some of, that's some of what the incels are talking about. I'm telling you, you really got to go into YouTube and just type in incel and get it, you know, like get a bottle of wine and check out for the next three hours <laughs> or smoke a joint, you know, like really get in there. It's really wild. My partner and I do it all the time. We have a big TV. We, you know, he ha we have some drinks and then we watch like incel videos for hours, you know, <laughs> okay. hours on end. It's amazing. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> you don't have any questions? Comments? Other ideas? People have opinions they want to share? Yeah. Are you shy? Do you feel... Is this some kind of consumerism? You just want us to keep on talking? Yeah. Or is it more of a, okay, the, the evening could end now feeling? Are we <laughs> shall we just go on? Oh, yeah, there's a question. Finally. <laughs> All right. Um, well, um, I was a bit confused when you said, uh, um, Winnie, that um, that we're losing the culture wars because if you listen to the right um, on the far right, like from their perspective, we are already in power. Right, the left is in power, um, and like when we think of you know like the last forty years of neoliberalism, um, like declining wage shares, income inequality, wealth inequality, deregulation of financial labor markets, etc., like it seems to us as if it's like complete irrationality from a right wing perspective to think that we are in power. But uh, in terms of the culture wars, I think that we have made some significant gains, um, and in my view. Like the dilemma is that, you know, like the new social movements, the feminist movement, the ecological movement, um, the anti-nuclear energy movement, um, the environmental movement, like they were successful at the same time that the labor movement um, was in decline, you know, like with strike levels going down, etc. And that therefore, like, we only could implement like neoliberal or like progressively neoliberal elements of like the, the original demands of the feminist movement, the environmental movement, etc., and that that has created this notion that we're just doing politics like for like some minorities, right? Like we have um, quotas on like like the 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 uh, corporations in like the large corporations like on the boards of them and stuff. Um, and we have like market solutions for the environmental crisis, like carbon emission trade. Um, and the question, like what I find so interesting about Sanders' campaign is that like you went back to universal demands that everybody understands and where everybody benefits from, right? Like if you have your $15, minimum, uh, 15 minimum wage, it's an anti-racist demand because like black Af and African Americans are predominantly in the low wage sector. Um, and so, and Latinos, um, right? Um, and so, um, like that is something that I, I think we can learn a lot from um, and we're wrapping our heads around what could be such universal demands that majorities actually gain from. And maybe you can say a little bit about those demands, like how they came about and, um, and what the impact was and et cetera. That's a, a great question. Um, to your first point, they lie when they say, when they, like, they're actually, like, we're lying to ourselves if we think we're winning the culture war because the culture, the culture is actually dominated by neoliberals. So when the right ac accuses the neoliberals of being, like, the left, the neoliberals are like, yeah, we're left, sure. Like, Barack Obama and, like, Michelle Obama are like, absolutely, we're leftists. And the thing is, when Barack Obama was in college, he was definitely a leftist. I mean, he, you know, he studied under Alinsky, he, like, you know, he was like a leftist. I'm sure Barack Obama has read Capital, there's no question in my mind. But like he has since become like a neoliberal. And that's, that's fine. But the right is saying the elites. And so they're saying everybody in Hollywood, everybody controlling the advertising agencies, all these like people who are, you know, um, at, the, at the, you know, the arbiters of like culture, fashion, commerce, all that art, right? That's like, that's run by like neoliberals. The left is building hegemony for sure. And every time, like, Bhaskar Sankara, who will, will be at the event tomorrow night, um, you know, is asked to guest edit the New York Times, I'm like, yeah, that's right. That's cool. That's great. You know? The fact that the Chapo boys got, like, a, a book deal, 
um, and is you know kind of known throughout by like normal people is good. But for the most part, the institutions of culture are controlled by neoliberals. But the right are saying, those are leftists. So they're actually winning. You know, they, they are winning. That's why they're winning elections. Because a lot of the MAGA people, like the MAGAs, you know, they're just like working class people who are, who are like, you know, living um, beneath the poverty line and, they, and they're listening to like Donald Trump and Donald Trump surrogates um, accuse, um, you know, um, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton of spending too much time with Hollywood liberals. That's the left that they're talking about. They very rarely attack, like, you know, Bernie. They call Bernie crazy. You know, D Donald Trump's line is crazy Bernie. But the reality is, crazy Bernie does have a special little army. And Claire and I are like, like generals in that army. We're like generals in like Bernie's little crazy army. It's not that little. It, we are the left, for sure, and we are building hegemony alongside DSA and Rosa Luxemburg and D. Lincoln. We're trying to form like, you know, a confederation, somewhat like a loose confederation. Hopefully that will flesh itself out over the next like several years. Otherwise we're really gonna be screwed. Um, um, and um, this army has like a culture, culture department, you know, an electoral department, an organizing department, a social movements department, and we all kind of hang out and talk. <laughs> we do. I think that's true. That's a, probably a good way of explaining it. Um, the culture department is really kind of led by the senator himself, where his Senate team produces like short videos on political economy, on like why Walmart workers deserve a raise. And yet, and yet, let's be clear, the neoliberals say Bernie's racist. You sit there in the audience as like Rosa Luxemburg's like fellow, you're an intellectual, and you say, well, inherently, a $15 an hour demand is anti-racist, not so, you know, by the neoliberals who don't actually want a $15 an hour minimum wage passed. They will actually figure out a way to um, accuse Bernie of being racist. They don't actually have that analysis that a $15 an hour minimum wage is inherently anti-racist or that um, a movement to, um, to radicalize domestic workers who are um, primarily women of color in America is um, anti-racist. They don't really want that. They want incrementalism. That's actually what they want. The, the neoliberals are only comfortable with incrementalism, which is why Hillary Clinton said, we can't have 15, we can only wait for 12. Who the hell can live on $12 an hour? Nobody. The re the, and there is a difference, I wanna be clear. Germany and America, like night and day. In America, when we are talking about poverty, we are talking about 55,000 people in Los Angeles, homeless, sleeping on the streets under a bridge. 55,000 in Los Angeles, 25,000 in New York. There are probably 300,000 homeless people in America, out of a population of 320 million, they say, oh, that's a drop in the bucket. That's like 10, what is that, like 1% of the population is homeless. You don't really have that. Do you, do you think that in Germany you have 1% of the population sleeping on the streets? Well, Maybe. We have 900,000 homeless people. How many? 900,000. Yeah, then you're doing worse than, than, than we are in many ways. You see what I mean? So this is what we're talking about. Bernie has normalized poverty. Neoliberals never want to talk about poverty. It's embarrassing to talk about being poor. They, it, like, no, the Democratic Party has spent like two, three, four, five decades since, I guess, the New Deal, since the Depression, since the pictures of like, you know, hungry white children, um, since they fixed that, you know. They moved all the black people to the projects with sort of the socialized, uh, welfare projects that were created in the 60s, right? And then that, that's, begun, that's sort of unraveling now, and the economy is not stable. And they never talk about, like, poverty until, and so Bernie does, but his, 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 his anti-poverty campaigning is always used against him by the neoliberals who say he's a racist. I mean, Claire can explain more about this because it's infuriating. Right. <laughs> yeah. There, well, that's a big one. Um, well, but just to go back to your question for a second about whether we're winning or losing the culture war, um, 
I think it's, I think we don't quite know yet in the sense that in, in, a, in a big picture way, so we're, we're still trying to figure out exactly how the internet is changing all of our cultures and our politics and our, our, our brains and our social connections. Um, I, I think that we're in, um, right now, increasingly rapid cycles of viral progress movements for equality and justice and egalitarian values, and then um, corresponding cycles of backlash and reaction that follow and sometimes are bigger than the original movement for equality. So we had the, the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movement that was immediately followed by a movement to um, support police officers as if police officers in the US didn't already have impunity to murder people with no accountability for any reason. Um, we saw increasing militarization of police, um, laws to criminalize protesting, which all followed a wave of, of activism that was created through a hashtag and people coming together organically. So the internet enabled this movement for justice and then there was this corresponding backlash. We saw with the Me Too movement. Um, do you have the Me Too movement here or are you yeah. using the similar hashtag? That, you know, that there was a, a, a very swift reaction that followed people thinking that the real victims were men being accused of sexual assault rather than um, people who are the victims of sexual assault. And so that backlash is still ongoing. Um, I think that, that in general this is, just, this is driving polarization for better and for worse. So uh, something that's really interesting is there's been some recent survey data that's come out about racial attitudes in the US following um, the election of Barack Obama and then Trump. And something that's, that's really uh, quite interesting is that as people who have voted for Trump have gotten more and more racist, as the Republican Party has gotten more and more racist, white people who are Democrats have actually become more and more racially progressive and, and more supportive of racial justice in reaction to Trump. So 10 years ago, there would have been a lot of white Democrats who would be opposed to athletes taking a knee and kneeling in sp at the beginning of sports games to protest police violence. And now, because President Trump is condemning those athletes and calling them out in such a racist, vitriolic way, white Democrats are reacting to that and becoming more progressive on racial justice issues than they would have been, which is in some ways a good thing. It's sort of, I, it's a little bit complicated. I don't know how to feel about it. Um, so. I understand that you just had 250,000 people marching here for the rights of immigrants and refugees and against Islamophobia, um, but at the same time, I'm sure you have a lot of people who are being radicalized online and who would support policies that just 10 years ago would have been unthinkable and totally outside the bounds of normal political conversation. So uh, I think that there are, we're, 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 we're building um, on, on the side of people who generally support our values. We're building, um, we're, we're moving in a progressive direction, but then there's an equal or sometimes greater reaction coming, reaction that's coming from the right and those people are increasingly living in a bubble and they have inherently more resources and power because they're motivated by trying to protect that and, uh, and, and shore it up from attempts to make things more equal. Yeah, I, I want to give you. I want to kind of give you one more sort of anecdote around institutionalization in the United States and how that's different um, here. The movement for Black Lives, I think, in my opinion, was neutralized by the state. Um, and again, this is a very nuanced explanation. Foundations in, in Europe are different than foundations in the United States. Foundations in the United States are um, f not funded by the government. Oftentimes foundations in Germany and in other places in Europe are funded by the government. Foundations in the United States are funded by multinational corporations. And they often will um, give money and funding to social movements in order to um, kind of quell the, the revolt. They, don't, they want to kind of control the messaging um, and they don't really want 
any social movement to develop into any type of really um, robust electoral movement, which would uh, result in electoral victory. So a nightmare for, I think, some of the sort of state watchers, the protectors of the state, as these social movements began to really develop uh, in, say, you know, in, in response to the 2008 financial meltdown. First you saw Occupy Wall Street, then you saw the movement for black lives, then you saw Standing Rock, then you saw Women's March, then you saw Me Too, and now we don't know what's next. Now we have incels, whatever, but like the movements of the left. The state has been very effective in neutralizing us. They really have. The Women's March less so, which is why we're, which is why some of the individuals at the top of the Women's March pecking order are being attacked brutally by the state. And, and this is something that I deal with on a regular basis. The Women's March actually resisted, the National Women's March resisted funding from, from foundations because they don't need it because we built a really strong email list and our email members give us money every month. So we're sustained by membership dues in the same way that unions have traditionally been able to do whatever they want because you don't really like have institutional power unless it's like powered by members, right? Which is why unions are so powerful and which is why unions actually have the ability to inform outcomes in elections if they were actually to become politically engaged. In the case of say National Nurses United when they became really engaged with Bernie, Bernie's campaign. Um, and so, so the Women's March is really enduring like attacks right now because we have, we raise a lot of money every month from our members. The DSA is another institution that, that is likely to be attacked soon, um, you know, by the state, state watchers, the state powers that be, because they also have um, a, mem uh, um, a, um, a membership program, which is sustaining their um, growth. So, you know, and again, you don't have that here in Germany because you're so lucky to have RLS. I mean, of course, RLS came to be because of very unfortunate and tragic circumstances, but that's why it's so important for those of you involved in RLS to, to stay involved and to help, you know, help, you know, win these elections that are coming up in May, you know? And so that's, that's actually why we're here. We're not really here just to, like, hang out. We're here to actually help Die Linke um, win the win in the European elections because you need representation in the EU because the right is, well, they're, they're going to win some seats. You know, I don't know who those little parties are being helped by Steve Bannon, but there are a lot of them and they're going to be like, you know, 12 or 13 newly elected right-wing MEPs in Brussels and they're going to be really weird and they're going to bring with them staff members who were like leaders in the incel movement, I'm pretty sure. You know, like the weird proud boy types, you know, so... I th thought it was interesting that you said that with the push pushing of the right, there was actually a shifting in the Democrats or part of the Democrats to be more racially um, outspoken. Because I think in Germany, I'd say for the most part of the political spectrum, the opposite is true. That like um, every single um, political party apart from the left party has shifted their views on migration and even in the left party there are discussions at the fringes. I mean it's not like it's not in the center of what we stand for but it's like there's I, I feel like the most of the political scene or the political class is kind of um, like the rabbit in front of, of the snake <laughs> and staring at, at the right wing and saying okay we cannot like we have, they say we, they say they oppose, but actually they fall in line with their politics. And I think, like we have those 250,000 people marching, and I think that's the counterpoint to that. But there's a lack of of bundling this up together, clustering this into a real political force. And I think that is, that is, yeah, that's a that's a problem. And it, it's hard to figure out how to be like as you said. Don't be too outspoken about capitalism, but a lot of yeah. people say, "Don't be too outspoken about the anti-racism you have, because you will um, you will push back on people that you might get um, uh, by being kind of more more on the side of economic populism." Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of a a dance that is going on. I mean, most of the political parties, I'd say, 
are not really dancing, but running to the right, <laughs> very very straightforward. But but I think it's a it's a problem within the in the public discussion in Germany and probably other European countries as well at the moment. But but if you if you think about the two hundred and fifty thousand people who showed up on the streets, those are your people. You got to reach them again. You have to keep. You got to get them. Like however you get how you get them, I don't know. That's like up to Dilinka and you know RLS and other. Um, you know, act, activist groups on, on the outside to actually say, well, what does this social movement look like? Like, what does, like, you know, how, how, do, how can we get them to stay involved? And of course, again, to be organized into um, helping to win these, these elections in, in May, but also when you have general elections again so that Die Linke can grow its size, its, its, yeah. you know, the size of its presence inside of Bundestag. That's very important. If you got 250,000 people onto the streets, because like they they are are firmly anti-racist. Those are your those are your people. Sure. You just got to find them and then bring them back in and, and keep them you know um, involved um, in any type of program. We we don't even really have that because in the United States like you know people like to march like they march like and then like there's like fatigue and then the institutions that are supposed to organize the marchers into doing something. Um, they get like kind of bought out by the foundations that fund them, right? Like any time, like, um, which is why like the Bernie people are, are an anomaly because they kind of can't stop us. We have an institution already. We have several institutions that are already confederated and working together, which is why some of the ideas coming from the senator are really taking shape because he has like well-organized social forces on the outside. It is what, you know, AOC and... Um, others are, are talking about when they say an inside-outside um, strategy of, of, of politics. In Europe, you've always talked about coalition politics and how, how it usually fails. Forget about coalition politics. I'm telling the party to work with the activists on the outside and how you can support them because that's what the AfD is doing with their weird right-wing activists. They're saying, yo, we're having a rally with these newly elected regional parliamentarians. You should show up with your swastikas and we'll tell you where it is and what time to show up, and then we'll also tell the media to show up, and then all of a sudden, it's a thing, and then in the United States, we're like, what is this? When I saw the reports of the AFD hate rally that was sponsored by the AFD, I was like, that's really new. You know, and you could do the same thing, you know, so. Um, I would just say on the, the conversation, of the, the point you raised about whether or not to talk about racial justice um, or, uh, uh, immigrant inclusion, uh, willingness to accept refugees versus economic populism. That is a debate that is happening in the U.S. Uh, of how much to talk about that. And I, I would say that I can't think of a single, except maybe actually Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who really put um, immigration or racial justice at the forefront of their campaign. I think the biggest issue in this past election that we saw was health care because that's the number one concern of voters um, in the US. And, and a lot of other economic issues were the, the issues of big concern. But increasingly, we're seeing that people are wanting their democratic politicians to be, um, to be able to talk about those issues in a, in a more nuanced way to really understand what's at stake for people. Um, and I think that the way that we're seeing that is politically most effective, we, we did some research on this um, out of the, uh, there's a center left policy shop that did a study that found that people even who voted for Donald Trump were more open to hearing a message about why racism was bad if it was explained to them as the billionaires and the people at the top are using these politics of division to divide us so that they can steal from us, so that they can take from us. So it's actually integrating economic populism with um, a, a message around racial justice and anti-xenophobia you know, xenophobia by explaining the way that those, uh, that those bigotries are used as tools of the economic elite. Um, so that was, that's one strategy that's been very effective. And of course, um, that is what Bernie has done for a long time. Uh, and that's, I think, why he's such an effective messenger right now. And then the second that we've seen is um, we've seen that uh, candidates of color have been able to just embody 
a message about racial equality, and then they actually have to talk about it less. So we've, there were candidates who actually faced incredibly racist attacks in their campaigns this year, and won without even talking about race at all. They talked about healthcare, but they were candidates of color, and they just embodied it, so they didn't even really have to address the issue. I mean, I want to know what you guys are thinking. Yeah. Like, what? Like, forget about like questions. Like, how do you feel about like this? How do you feel about like the rise of the right? You know, as young people, like, I just want to hear from anybody in the audience. Yeah, and then maybe we'll break because we've been talking for a while. Yeah. But it might be nice to hear something else from. Yeah, like I don't like it's not that important like what we're saying. Like, I want to hear about. I want. I'm, we're here to learn about like what's happening here in Germany so that we can be helpful and so. Who wants to share their thoughts? Are you? Wow. Yes. Scared. Um, so I actually studied in Passau, which is in Low Bavaria, um, which is right at the border to Austria. So uh, lots of refugees arrived there in 2015, 2016. And um, to be honest, um, from a student point of view, which is like the university is quite a, um, well, what can be Bavarian considered like version, version of leftist <laughs> microcosm, but from, um, as lots of students were, uh, the students were mainly the ones who kind of helped, uh, and also I founded an association because there still can be like, uh, lots be done. Um, I actually thought, okay, we kind of manage kind of well, with the situation and um, like we had the trouble with institutions and everything um, being in our way basically but I was to be honest like living in Paso for four years I was very shocked or maybe I was actually shocked about how much I was actually shocked um, how successful the AfD was in the end because um, to me, it was very, like, all the NGOs and the integration, like, work was very obvious on the street, and there weren't, like, too many problems obvious, and also talking to people on the street, they were really, like, except for, like, housing issues and everything that were, like, back in the, li in, like, in the limelight. Um, they wouldn't address these issues to us when asked them, but then at the end so many people voted for it. So I really feel like it's, on the one hand side, there are those right extremists where I feel like, okay, I'm talking to an actual aggressive wall and I don't know how to, like, there's this whole issue, like, do you talk, even try to argue with a Nazi or not? Like, is there a point or do you just spend too much energy try to get those centrist people who feel like, they don't know anymore whom to vote or they want to, like, I don't know, punish um, all the established parties by voting the AfD. But then sometimes when addressing people, I feel like they don't even dare to tell me that they actually have these anxieties. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the end, they still vote the AfD. And I really find it, like, I'm actually from the, like, part, member of the Green Party. But I try, I find it really difficult how to reach them sometimes on the street because um, I've, I sometimes think like, okay, this person might be anxious about these questions, but I don't know, do they not know how to tell me it, how to verbalize it, and they still fall for these like narratives. So I really wonder how to get the people on the couch because they're like probably complaining all the time sitting there on the TV, but they don't talk to me in the street. The only ones talking to me in the street are those who either like reproduce my own ideas or who like, are misogynist from the first sentence on, then I'm like, okay, you know what, fuck off. <laughs> like, I don't know. So I wonder what about these, it must be a huge number. Um, I wanna th thank you for that uh, thoughtful insight. Um, that is very thoughtful, um, especially coming from a young person. I really appreciate that. Um, you should run for office <laughs> um, or, st or, or, or work on a political campaign because the fact that you're admitting that you want to actually convert them to see things differently is a good sign. So absolutely, any time you see someone that you, you can have a conversation with, you should try to get them on the couch and say, hey man, let's talk about like why, like why you're feeling this way. 
tell me why you're feeling this way, and then like listen to them, and then have a conversation, and then try to persuade them into seeing things your way, which is a more egalitarian way, a more sort of common way, um, I think. I mean, that's why I think you're in this room. So I think that that's good, but again, people living under capitalism, you know, they, they live in, um, their world is very atomized, you know? They work um, long hours at jobs, you know, making, you know, pretty good wages because, you know, Germans make a pretty good wage, especially if you work, you know, in an industrial job, especially in Bavaria, they're exhausted. Um, they don't want to talk about their feelings. Um, they don't even know what their feelings are sometimes, and so it's hard for them to express themselves. And so as a young person, the fact that you have so much empathy, you can see and feel it, is good. You know, you actually can shine a light on their internalized process, whatever that, whatever that must be, which is probably some degree of pain, right? If you're, if you're sensing that they're anxious, it's probably because they are anxious, you know, and, and they're, they're going on YouTube and, and they're seeing, you know, the incel videos and, you know, weird other videos about, like, migrants, you know, coming across the border to, like, rape German women, whatever, whatever, whatever those narratives are, and then they're just like, shit, I'm really anxious right now, like, is my daughter going to get, like, raped by a, a Libyan migrant, like, what's going to happen to me, I work so hard, like, I work 14 hours a day, at the, at the auto factory, I come home, and I'm going to just vote for the AfD because they are presenting an alternative. Because, of course, the center is cratering, like we, we talked about earlier. They're not presenting an alternative vision in the same way that, like, Bernie or Corbyn or even Podemos have done. Um, Die Linke are certainly doing their best to, to do so, but it's, like, a smaller party, and they don't have as much of an audience. So it's really up to the young people like you and all the other folks in this audience to say, you know what, I'm going to have as many conversations as I possibly can with um, people who I, who, um, I may have differing political views um, and try to explain to them like how I see things in the world and I think you know that's like a good starting place I think yeah I think that there's there's um we have to be careful because there's uh there can be a slippery slope where sometimes people on the left feel like we even on the left feel like we have to capitulate in any way to those ideas or not strongly condemn the 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 public spokespeople, the political figures, um, the, the, the political parties, and the policy ideas for fear of not alienating some of those people who theoretically should be part of our coalition. And I think we absolutely have to confront them, the leaders and the parties, every step of the way, and not think that we need to capitulate to those ideas. At the same time, I think we can speak with empathy to individual voters, many of whom are um, just confused, you know. I think sometimes we think about voters as having very clear ideologies, but they're not. They're emotional. They are easily swayed. They're they're they are indoctrinated in belief systems that they can abandon if someone else is able to um, speak to them um, and and offer them a more convincing explanation of how the world works. Um, so I, I don't think we should ever give up on, and this was Hillary Clinton's major mistake, her biggest mistake in the 2016 presidential campaign was to call Trump voters deplorables. And then what ended up happening was that every single person who lived in a rural state in the US said, the Democratic Party thinks I'm deplorable, thinks people who are like me aren't worth even talking to were like throwaway people. And we saw people in the Democratic Party later say, you know what, it's so great that all of these Trump voters are gonna lose their health care now. Or sometimes they would even say, it's so great that people in Kentucky are gonna lose their health care. Of course, not everyone in Kentucky even voted for Donald Trump. Only a minority of people in Kentucky voted for Donald Trump because the majority of people didn't vote or voted for Hillary, but you know, Trump did, did did win Kentucky, so it's uh, it's cruel and not strategic to say we're so glad that the people in Kentucky are going to lose their health care. Um, but I, I don't think we should stop confronting the political leaders 
and the people who represent those ideas, um, but also making the appeals to those voters, especially if we can do the do the um, the dance of explaining how they are being manipulated in the service of people who are really trying to screw them over and take away the things that they rely on, their their wages, their time, their pensions, their security, um, etc. So, I think that. Um a lot of political leaders are actually just scared themselves, you know? They could be ex experiencing the same, same type of like confusion and fear um, that, you know, that, um, you know, some of the workers and normal people in Bavaria that you encounter during your college years experience. They, they could, you know, they're just like a little scared, you know? They're like, we feel weird and scared and we don't know how to articulate and express ourselves and we're out of touch with our feelings. We don't really have a community. We hang out with these weird lobbyists and these like corporation like leaders and executives, you know, they don't have, you know, like a community. Like they, they are, are very divorced from community. And that's really unfortunate. Um, and, and that's the same in United States politics. And, you know, the, the large number of um, elected officials are, are pretty like, you know, they're like, um, you know, they're like not having fun, like, you know, like you guys came, your buddies, and then the four of you came in together, your buddies, you probably hang out, you know, and have dinners and talk about politics and talk about your feelings, right? Like these people who are in elected office, they don't get to do that. It's important to do that. It's important to actually have a community and be a part of a community, I think. Um, and so I have some, you know, I, I sometimes like look at politicians and I'm like, oh, they're a little bit dead inside. In the same way that I say that I'm a little bit dead inside for different reasons, they're definitely a little bit dead inside because they haven't, you know, they just haven't experienced, you know, joyful things like dancing and, you know, loving and, you know, even though I don't do that anymore either because I'm a little bit, <laughs> a little bit dead inside. <laughs> there are two more. Do you want? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so um, you first and then uh, Inga and I think we'll bundle you together and then have yeah. a final one. Here. Is there anybody else who has a, okay, so then here in the front and then. So are we still uh, wanting to talk about how we feel? That's, yeah, sure. yeah, okay. Uh, some restraints. Yeah. yeah, no, it's not gonna be long. <laughs> My feelings are short. Uh, so for me personally, when I uh, see the news about uh, things going on in Germany or things going on in European politics, and uh, seeing how the vocabulary is becoming more acceptably offensive and seeing how the irrational seems to be taking the upper hand more and more, um, I get very pretty nervous to imagine what the situation will be in 10 years and um, thinking that I, I definitely do feel a part of a community but I don't think m myself or my community is doing anything and I don't want to make politics my, the main part of my life because my life is dedicated to other projects uh, but I, yeah, I really want to not be one of the many, many, many people who are sitting and being shocked at all of this and discuss with their friends, oh, it's so bad, but then that's it, and then it just rolls over and turns into a bigger thing, and we just sat there shaking our heads. That makes me really nervous, and I, I mean, I vote, I sign petitions, and I go to demonstrations, that's it. <laughs> the guy is there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I want to um, come back to the to to the idea of um, the communities because um, it was mentioned that like all those people came out to the Untalba demonstration, like the quarter of a million, and also the Sea Bridge and like all sorts of of um, um, demonstrations. But I think we as leftists would be mistaken to think that the addition of all those movements will create majorities because even after that two hundred fifty thousand um, people march we lost all the elections to the far right, um, like right, like in, within weeks um, or days and weeks. Um, and I think like the, the real difficulty is that um, we are losing like, you know, non-ideologically oriented people, which is like 80 or 90% of the population, like who are neither on the side of the racists nor on the side of the leftists. And um, like you can see it in the unions, and Passau is, is a very good example. We did a study from the foundation 
on right-wing populism in the trade union movement. And it's like, it's a really significant problem, especially about, like, amongst, like, leading, like, labor leaders. Um, who are saying things like, you know, a society, like uh, almost 50% of those say, like a society that, that tries to uh, take everyone along um, is doomed to fail, right? So like there's this, an extreme social Darwinism within corp like business uh, unionist unions. And um, PASA was an example that many people, um, like um, hundreds left the IG Metall, the metal workers union saying, you know, like you never did, like now there's all these refugees, you have those solidarity campaigns for refugees, but you never did anything for us, right? Like we as the, the, the general workers. Um, and I think that we have to break through this um, particularistic, compartmentalized way of leftism, right? Like we do something for that small group here and for that small group there. And I was wondering, since you mentioned the unions as um, um, with the union dues, like um, from the way I, perceived it, like from here, what the biggest problems of the Sanders campaign were, like Debbie Wasserman and Schultz, of course, like all the early registration stuff um, in New York that broke his back during the primary elections, but also like the terrible role that the, um, uh, the SEIU and, and other unions played. And like, I'm wondering, like, how is the campaign, like since Bernie said that he's probably gonna run in 2020, um, like how is the camp, how are you actually um, prepared for, for tackling the problem of early registration in the Democratic Party and also with the unions, um, like to not let the unions shift to the um, lesser evil centrist kind of argument again. Um, just to quickly first answer your um, insight, um, you're doing everything right, you know, by participating, electing, voting, uh, like voting, voting and then, you know, showing up to demonstrations. Um, I think it's very normal to feel anxiety and to feel that like in 10 years time this could be apocalyptic. In my mind it's already, it's been apocalyptic f for a long time now. So that's why I'm a little bit dead inside if you want to talk about feelings. You know, I'm like, oh shit, like what are we, what's going to happen in 10 years time? It could be really bad, but it could also be better or even really good. So what... Um, Naomi Klein always says, the great activist Naomi Klein and, and, and thinker, she always says, you never, ever, ever let the shock settle in. I always hear her voice. Every time I feel shocked, which is like every day, every day I like wake up and I'm like, oh, I feel so shocked. And then I'm like, oh well, let's keep it moving. You never can let the shock settle. You can't let it normalize in your body. You have to constantly feel shocked. And in that way, you'll stay alive and you'll be able to respond. It's only when you let the shock normalize in your body, like the, the disgust, you know, the anger, the rage that you feel at the injustice. It's only that, it's only then when you, when you are really truly dead inside, then you become one of them. So you should feel that, you should feel this way every day. You should feel shock and disgust and rage. It's, it's normal and you should react to those feelings by participating in, whatever comes your way, whatever, you know, RLS gives you a task or uh, something to do or someplace to go, always participate if you have time and energy. You're young, you're healthy, you have friends in a community, join up, show up, you know, shut it down, run for office, help elect somebody in Dilinka when they're running in May. I mean, all these things are true. Just don't let the shock normalize in your body. So I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you for coming out. Um, to your point, the unions in America are not going to support Bernie in 2020. I just want to be really honest. Um, also, the trade union movement in America is not nearly as strong as the trade union movement in Germany and elsewhere. We have um, under 11% participation, closer to nine now, because of the recent um, rulings by Trump and his cabinet. So in the last 19 months, he's really, really um, overturned um, um, a, a lot of... Um, union power. Um, so, you know, 9% participation isn't very much at all. Um, and so we can expect SEIU to support um, not Bernie in 2020. In fact, I could almost tell you who, who they're going to support, but I don't, this is going to be like released to RLS and I don't want to go on record as saying who they will support, but it assuredly will not be Bernie. The nurses likely will support Bernie, but um, the 2020 election is not going to be about trade unions and how they impact 
Bernie at all because Bernie um, already has built his own institution. He has a pretty big email list, which is capable of raising large numbers of um, donations from small dollar donors. He'll raise hundreds of millions of dollars from regular people. $10 here, $27 there. He's fine in terms of the fundraising department. Unions provide, you know, usually monetary support and bodies to knock on doors. So um, as far as like trade unions in Europe are concerned, I think that some unions are um, doing great work right now in Germany as well as in, in the United Kingdom and in Spain by organizing workers to rise up against, you know, Amazon and Google and Facebook. All of that type of like um, worker up the sort of international workers uprising that we're seeing right now is good. And as a party, do you think it should definitely be more active and, and supporting um, that type of movement? Um, but in general, I think that, I think that um, building trades, you know, and um, like, uh, like laborers, those folks are gonna be aligned with the right. Um, they were aligned with Donald Trump and they still are. And, and that's different than service sector um, unionists. It's a, it's a very complicated question that requires that union leaders actually examine like where capital is headed. And I don't think they're ready to do that. I don't think they re really know how to. I mean, maybe that's your role here at Rosa Luxemburg is to you know provide like the necessary political education for union members to sort of say hey here here's where we're headed you know we're headed to a future where machines actually will replace um, some of the skilled workforce for like iron workers or metal workers that that is that is happening those jobs aren't coming back and and the the iron workers in like rural Germany are like man my job my job is probably never going to come back same for the iron workers in Brazil. You know, that's why what's his face won? Jared Bolsonaro and they jailed Lula because Lula well, you know why. I mean like this is not this is this is this is literally because the pool of capital is shrinking. Those jobs are not sustainable, so they're not gonna come back and so these workers are really freaked out. You know, in Brazil the average metal worker dies at like fifty five or something. Like they die at fifty five. They work they start working at like the metal shop when they're like 18 and by 55 they're dead. That's just insane. Which is why we have to start thinking about a future without work. I know that's like really radical, but like, I mean, you know, I mean, this, I, I'm, not, I'm like at Rosa Luxemburg so I can say these things, you know? Like, what like Marx said then is actually possible now. It is possible now, you know? But how we get there really depends on like whether or not like we can you know, elect progressives to lead in Europe, where there's a strong, you know, federated Europe and a progressive America and United Kingdom? I don't know, I mean, it's hard to say, right? Like, these are big questions that I don't think any of us can answer, but I think that, like, we have to try. Um, if we don't try, we, we lose, you know? But it's good that, like, these types of convenings are, are happening. It's good that, like, the senator had, um, the senator's wife held a, a meeting last weekend in Vermont. Fernando Haddad was there. Ada Colau was there. Yanis Varoufakis was there. That's fine. But it was good to like, it was good for me at least to actually spend time with Fernando Haddad to ask him about what really happened in Brazil. And in 15 minutes, he made very clear to me what happened. And I learned a lot from him. And so that makes me a better organizer and it makes me better able to come to Germany to work with like Die Linke and to, with Rosa Luxemburg to hopefully help you guys um, win two, three, four, five more seats in, in, in May. So. Um, I'm gonna go in the opposite order. Just on the, the issue of, uh, of Bernie and unions, um, as Wendy said, the, the, the unions are really part of the Democratic Party establishment overwhelmingly. Uh, we, there, were a, there were actually two major unions that endorsed Bernie in 2016, National Nurses United and Communication Workers of America. Those were the two unions that allowed their members to vote on the endorsement. Every other union just had the national leadership uh, decide. And so that's, um, and that's something that we saw replicated in state and local elections across the country. Um, Hannah and I um, worked, and, and Winnie also advised on a campaign for governor in uh, the state of Michigan. And we had a candidate who um, 
I think 85% of the members voted to endorse him, and maybe another 5%, 5 or 10% voted to endorse this other guy, and only 5% voted to endorse the Democratic establishment pick. And the state leadership also supported our candidate, and the national executive director stepped in and endorsed the establishment candidate who only 5% of their workers supported. So that's just what will happen. Um, I do think that uh, it's too bad that because they're gonna provide a lot of support in terms of money and people knocking on doors, but one of the benefits of having such a crowded field with so many candidates who are gonna run in 2020 is that I think that the establishment support will um, either wait until an establishment pick kind of emerges as the establishment front runner who's going to run against Bernie and try to stop Bernie, or um, it will be diluted among multiple candidates. So that's something that will be very strongly in Bernie's favor because he is right now the person who got Jeff Bezos to quote tweet him and tag him telling the world that he was going to give workers $15 an hour. And he is the one who got the severance for the Toys R Us workers. There were a number of workers at a long-standing chain that was taken over, um, and that uh, was taken over by Bain Capital, and they lost their severance. And he was the one who brought the workers into his office and got them their severance. So, doing that, doing that work on behalf of low-wage workers, standing with them, organizing with them, working with them on the picket lines, will I think mean that the workers back him even if the institutions of the unions themselves uh, don't, which we, we won't expect. Um, and uh, in, ter in terms of your question, I think, I hope that you, that you don't feel any sense of, thank you for sharing that, um, at that uh, just statement of how you're feeling right now, and I think a lot of people can probably relate to it. Uh, I hope you don't feel any sense of insecurity or, or fear about how you feel, because I think many people um, wake up every day and are terrified about everything that's happening and think that they don't know what to do or that what they're doing can't possibly be enough. And I think we just have to see that as um, something that is positive and something to appreciate in ourselves that we are concerned about the world not measuring up to our values and our hopes and see it as a source of motivation um, and also hopefully see, look around for opportunities to do the work that we think is most vital and most necessary. And if we don't see anyone doing it, then find ways to do it ourselves and, and create the work that has to be done if no one else is doing it. So maybe you can um, identify a need that no one is organizing around and, and organize. Or maybe Delinka will. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, I'm just... I, just to add, I think um, what helps best against being afraid is organizing with people who fight the, straight, the same fight, like, because that's the only place where some strength and um, some power of at least defending ourselves um, will come from. So if anybody is interested even in meeting people that are not going out on the streets, are all invited to come with us to the doors and knock and uh, talk about the experiences people have there. And it is actually interesting how, how much you get into discussions with people, um, even with people who come to disagree or came to disagree um, with our, or with the left um, perspective on how the world should work. Well, so thank you very much, everybody, if, uh, for coming out. And I'd like, of course, to thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for our Stiftung for holding this venue, inviting our beautiful guests over. Um, I'd like very much to uh, thank the translators, guys. Thank you very much for staying with us for the whole evening. And of course, the people who provided us with drinks and everything. And most of all, uh, thank you very much, Winnie and Claire, for coming over thank this um, long distance and sharing all your insights and experiences with us, which is very helpful and powerful. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.